Nine months into your run in WCW, I'm sure, did Andy here watch the Nitro where Goldberg beat Hulk Hogan? Yeah. And you beat Hogan in front of 40,000 fans in the Georgia Dome. Um, what was that like? How did it come about? What was your, your mentality going into it? Um, it was the coolest night of my life, wrestling-wise, up until my last comeback. But um, sitting at home on a Thursday evening, watching... WCW Thunder, there's a guy named, anybody remember J.J. Dillon? J.J. Dillon pops out, hey, there's a big announcement we got. Hulk Hogan's defending his title against Goldberg on Monday Night Nitro. What the hell? I had no idea. Uh, No idea. I was just like you guys. I was just like any other person, a fan. I was scared to death. I mean, I've only been in the business for a very short period of time. And here I had to be in the ring with a guy named Hulk Hogan. It was uh, it was pretty intimidating, but um, yeah, you know, I, I you have to pounce on opportunities when they're presented. Period. End of story. What was I going to do? Say no, I'm not ready yet. I'm, I'm I'm afraid. So I went out there and I did my thing. You know, I uh, I've been very lucky that there've been many guys that helped me along the way. And there have been others who have, you know, tried to hold me down along the way. But um, you learn from them and you learn to appreciate them and what they do because it makes you a bigger and better person. And then you, you become the champion in WCW. We talked about the fact that streak ended and Kevin Nash won. And then one of the most famous incidents in wrestling that people talk about is the finger poke of doom uh, that happened on the first Nitro of 1999. And I think what's a bit of a misconception is that when that happened and you got the beat down at the end of that show... The ratings were still pretty good, and people were invested in seeing Goldberg. Go figure. Beaten. They thought I was done. And then you're, you know, everybody I think thinks you're going to go through the NWO, and you're going to finally get to Hogan or Nash, and there's going to be this kind of like final big match on pay-per-view, and it didn't really pan out that way. Um, how important do you think that is? A lot of people talk about that as one of the big downfall moments or a missed opportunity. Do you see it that way, or do you think it was just uh, one small part of a much bigger picture? Um, honestly, if it was anybody other than Hogan at that point, um, looking at it at a pay-per-view would have been the right thing to do, but we're talking about a Nitro 30 years later, right? Something like that. That's unheard of. Do you remember many other Nitros? You know, I mean, it pretty much was a staple of any Nitro that ever was put on the air that 44,000 people are in the stands at the Georgia Dome watching me beat Hogan. It's just like when I wrestled uh, DDP and we went long, you know, at Halloween Havoc and then they had to show part of it on, on Nitro the next night. Hey, there are opportunities that many people think that we missed, but I think we did, I think we made up for it pretty well. I mean, they had, at that time, it wasn't like I was going to give an idea or an opinion. Um, They had a handle on the wrestling fans. And they chose to do it the way that they did. And I I really don't try to second guess it. But um, they did miss an opportunity because if they were able to put 44,000 in the seats in Georgia in a matter of five days, uh, I guarantee you if they would have, had a stadium that had 100,000 people, if they would have given them 20 days, I bet there would have been that many people there. And then in 1999, WCW decided to try a different approach and they brought in Vince Russo. And he was booking the TV shows and you can see there's a very big difference in the presentation of WCW when he takes over. Um, And you said, you know, you're you're a guy, it's not your job to have an opinion about the creative, it's your job to come and do what you're going to do. Was it tougher by that point to, to keep to that ethos? It was weird because I was in the professional wrestling world prior to Vince Russo coming, but when he got there, I felt like I was really in professional wrestling. You know, I mean, it was it was over the top. Uh, I always thought he was a plant for WWE, always, <laughs> because of 90% of the things that he did. Um, he's just nuts. That's his way. Of, I guess that's his way of thinking and his way of entertaining people. Um, 
you know, you can read all you want. You can hear all you want about me absolutely wanting to eat that guy's head off. But if I didn't have compassion in my heart, the night that I speared him into the barrier, I would have done it about five minutes earlier if he wouldn't have had it, when he didn't have his helmet on if I didn't care. They told me to go out, and he didn't have his helmet on. I wasn't going to do it because I would have killed him. And I waited for him to put his helmet on. So, Vince, you're welcome. <laughs> and um, one of the most controversial decisions that, that he made, I think, was, was to turn you heel. And I think it's still something that a lot of people maybe wish hadn't happened. And I just wonder how you feel about it and how you feel about it looking back now. You know, as a professional wrestler, it's your job at the end of the day to be, to number one, listen to your boss, and number two, be, have the ability to, to turn the wrestling fans on their head. Survivor Series, you know, me and Brock. Um, you got to pe- keep people guessing, and you got to try to trick them, you know, as often as possible. Well, having me being heel, you know, was, you know, for me, it was the worst time in, my, in the wrestling business. Um, for them, they thought it was very cool, and, and I, I, I get that. I understand that, and that's one of my downfalls in the business is that I took – being a superhero too lightly. I mean, too, not too lightly, too, too seriously, because they had me uh, beat up um, Hacksaw Jim Duggan that night, and he was a baby face, obviously, and he had just come back from beating cancer, right? And I had a Make-A-Wish kid that night, a little girl that had cancer, and they made me go out there and beat Hacksaw up, and it brought me to tears, uh, both stepping out of the ring and, and walking into my dressing room afterwards because in my eyes, if one little girl, one little boy who looked up to me uh, lost faith in me because of an action that I did in, in the wrestling business, I could never forgive myself. And that's completely opposite of what a wrestling character should think about because his... His whole existence is based on keeping people at the edge of their seat. And Goldberg turning heel was keeping people at the edge of their seat. But I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So it lasted 24 hours, and then I went back. <laughs> so. You gave it your best shot. You, you did it. And I, I wonder the way. I didn't give it my best shot by any means. I didn't even give it a shot. I didn't give it a chance. And I guarantee you, I would have been the biggest, baddest, fire-breathing dragon heel in the world. But it's just, I couldn't do it, man. I, I worked so hard to, in playing professional football to try to uh, attain a level of the success that kids could look up to. And I could set an example, a positive example for them. And uh, I didn't see any future in setting positive examples being a heel. So I'm sorry if I didn't turn heel. 